Welcome to the Myth and Magic Authors Podcast, folklore and fantasy topics aimed at creative storytellers. To write stories and challenge your brain with exciting ideas, delve into these presentations and reflections. See how fantasy realms are based on actual world history, legend, and lore. Study fairy tales, nature fables, and supernaturalism to engage in a jumble of concepts that will trigger your fancy and get you writing imaginatively. Now, here's your host, Neil Mack. Hello, fantasy fiction fans, and welcome to another edition of Myth and Magic the Fantasy Writers Podcast. And it's the 16th of March when I'm recording this. This will go out on the 17th of March and we're approaching the New Year. It's not our New Year, it's the Iranian New Year. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But I'm also going to talk today about creating fear. How to handle fear and how to portray fear in your novel. But first, let me talk a bit about what I call the spring clean shake-up. And I want to start by talking about Nose, Nose, which is spelled N-O-W-R-U-Z. Nose um, has been celebrated since the reform of the Iranian calendar in the 11th century uh, to mark the new year. It falls on the March equinox, that is the day we call the first day of spring. So it's usually around March the 21st next week. The word means quite literally new day, Noruz. And house cleaning and what Persian people call house shaking is the most important ritual in Noruz. And in the West, we too tend to do something similar. We do do spring cleaning, although perhaps not in a ritual way. And when we do our spring cleaning, perhaps it's to keep ourselves busy during the month of Lent, which is also around this time. But let's talk about spring cleaning. Spring cleaning makes you feel refreshed and invigorated and even reborn. It's a great way to restore and renew a damp or a lethargic spirit, a spirit that has perhaps become weary and drained during the long winter months. So since it's almost time for Ainora's spring cleaning, and don't forget in Iran they call it a shake-up, here are some things that you can do to shake up your writing project. So Here's my tips to shake up a manuscript. I've got seven ways to shake your manuscript up. And here's the first one. Make it your story. Look at the book again, or look at the piece of work you've done, and ask yourself this. How does this story connect with me? Because you ought to see some connections between the book and your own experiences and your own realities, and even the characters you should see connections between either one or more characters in your book and your own character. So go through the chapters in your book now. You don't have to read the entire book. Just go through the chapters, even if it's just in your head, and see if you can find these connections. Do you find any connections? These connections don't have to be written big, and they obviously don't have to be necessarily discernible to anyone but you. But if you can't find some kind of emotional connection between you and your current novel, then you won't tingle. And if you don't tingle, and if you don't find a personalised emotional connectedness or some emotional anchor to the events you are telling, if you don't feel engaged or involved with the story, if you don't feel engaged and involved, how is a reader supposed to participate in it? This type of clean-up, or the shake-up, I call genomic storytelling. Genomic storytelling because your genomes should be inside the book you write. And if you use your own experiences and your own realities and even your own character inside a book, then it will help you to convey realistic emotions in your story and will also mean that your book becomes something to be proud of because you created it, it's yours. But not only that, it's about you and it's for. So make it your story. My next shake-up tip is this. Redo the cover art concepts in your head. Have you already chosen the cover art for this, by the way? If not, do it now. How does the cover that you propose to use relate to your words? And how does the cover relate to you and your genomic storytelling? 
In other words, how does it relate to you? And how does the cover relate to the protagonist? And is the cover, and this is an important bit of it, is this cover the best possible cover in the whole wide world? Is it the best cover you can imagine? If not, what would you prefer? Dream up something better. How can you make the cover of your dreams come true? Now, for this exercise, you don't need to hire a new artist or spend lots of money on cover art. It's a those shake-ups, and it's an intellectual exercise. And it's designed to determine with some certainty that your book is steering in the right direction. In other words, it's going in the direction that you originally planned it to go. And all projects need some kind of orientation or reorientation now and then. And some people, that reorientation is an image-based reorientation rather than a words-based reorientation. So that's why it's important to look at the cover art again and ask yourself, is this the best cover I could possibly have? Our next tip is to think about experiences. Life is a series of experiences. But what have you experienced in the last 12 months? And how are those experiences relived, recounted, explored and evaluated in your new book? Have you been recounting your most recent experiences in your most recent writing project? If you do, you will see the story light up and respond. This is something that songwriters do. They don't try to think about something that happened 25 or 30 years ago. They talk about what happened in the last year in their songs. If you use recent experiences, then your story will become very rewarding and compelling for you, as well as your readership. My next tip is this. It's to illuminate some text. So take a paragraph, a phrase or a stanza from your latest project. It doesn't have to be a fully edited book, by the way. It doesn't have to be complete. Just a passage from the work you're currently doing. And it ought to be an accomplishment that you're justifiably proud of. A really, really good line or a really, really good sentence. And create a meme or superimpose your chosen words on top of an image or use an attached photograph. But however you do it, post those special words onto your social media because it will help you focus on your best writing or focus on the best of you and your writing because it's a concentrated piece of illuminated text. It's what the monks used to do once upon a time in the dark ages. They chose an important part of a, normally a prayer or a Bible story and they illuminated it to make it even more important. And this will help you prioritise where your project ought to be heading while at the same time it will be keeping sensible horizons in view. My next tip is this read your work aloud. I've said this before and I'll say it again a hundred times, I'm sure. You must, absolutely must, read your work aloud. If you've never done this before, it will feel strange when you do it for the first time, but it will be so worth it that you won't know why you haven't tried it before. Start at the beginning, yes, read aloud the opening two paragraphs of your most recent draft. What happened? I bet a king's ransom that you started to make amendments and retouches right away. Why is that? Why didn't you see the errors and the flaws earlier, even though you read those same paragraphs a hundred times before? Well, it's because when you read aloud, you get to hear the hidden conjugations and the hidden relevance and even the hidden emotionality of the words you've chosen. This effect is known as the syntony of recital. In other words, you don't notice the balance of words until you recite them. So eventually, eventually, you will read the entire manuscript. But for now, I just want you to concentrate on reading the most important passages. And ask yourself, how do the words flow? Do the sentences have a rhythm? Do the lines carry poignancy and subtlety and forcefulness? Do the words reverberate? Does your text contain emotion? You'll never know any of these things unless you read it out loud. My next tip is this. Do an elevator pitch for your novel or your poem or your next project. What makes your story unique? Because that's really what an elevator pitch is all about. It's telling a stranger what makes your project so unique. An elevator pitch, if you didn't already know, is a 30-second speech that tells the customer or the prospective customer everything they need to know about your book. 
And please remember, this has to be developed. It has to be elaborated. You don't know it already. I'm telling you that now. It comes out of your head through hard work. It won't come out of nowhere and it won't be easy to do. So your elevator pitch must be short. It must be direct. It must be punchy. And I suppose, above all, it must be hooky. There should be a hook in it, which um, the prospective client, which in your case is going to be your next reader, will say, oh, that's interesting. So play around with the words, play around with the phrases, play around with the rhythms. Don't attempt to write the, or rewrite the plot or even give away the plot. Because don't forget, you only have 30 seconds to explain your idea. So this is all about what the idea of the book is. And of course, once you've finished your elevator pitch, once you've actually polished and honed it, you must read it out aloud too. My next tip is this. Get your protagonist or your antagonist to surprise you. When was the last time your protagonist or your antagonist surprised you? If you think this is a strange question, then you might not be allowing your characters the space and freedom they need to exist and to grow significantly on the page. Yes, they might survive. Yes, they might subsist. But do they have freedom to grow? Do they enjoy freedom to explore? But hopefully you didn't think it was a weird question, so I'll ask it again. When was the last time your character surprised you? Because if you weren't surprised, then how can you expect an audience to be surprised? Try to mix things up a little bit. Let a hero, for example, take an alternative path and see what happens. Or let a heroine choose the other deal that she's been offered and follow that through. Or let an antagonist give the protagonist the upper hand for once and see what develops. You don't have to restructure your entire novel to do this spring clean shake up. Just conjure up some ideas and jot them down. And if you want, bounce those ideas off your audience using your social media platform. You don't have to do this for the entire novel either. Just the parts that you think might, you might have got bogged down with or are awkward or unwieldy. And it's worth telling you that this is just a mind game. Just to look at the what ifs and have fun. The spring cleaning shake ups help reaffirm your commitment to character autonomy. And don't forget that an autonomous character is an exciting character. So I told you that I would be talking about how to impart fear in your next fantasy fiction work. And I want you to think Shaggy Rogers. And I want you to overzoink your characters with their startle response. And for this, I'm going to talk a bit about something called the hormonal cascade. I was recently listening to the famous Bravo to Zero author, Andy McNabb, who, if you don't know, he was a soldier in the special forces in Iraq. And he was talking about how to deal with fear and how humans deal with impending mortal danger. And he put it in clear perspective for me when he suggested that fear was a primordial instinct that dates back to what he called caveman times and can only be rationalised if you remember that there are actually only three outcomes when you're faced with deadly danger. Outcome number one is you freeze, outcome number two is you run or outcome number three is you eat what threatens you. And I thought this was the most elegant explanation that I've ever heard for fight and flight. They call it fight and flight, but it's actually scientifically known as the acute stress response. And you would have heard it before. It's a well-known phrase that tries to describe what happens when you face deadly danger. But I think it leaves out the crucial freeze bit of the chemistry. You know, the freeze and don't do anything or don't say anything or don't move. And I also think significantly, and perhaps even more significantly, if you're a fantasy writer, it leaves out the crucial eat bit of the mechanics. But perhaps because Andy is a soldier, a daring soldier, and he stared deadly danger in the face many times before, I think he adds special forcefulness to those dimensions, the freeze bit and the eat bit. When faced with a deadly event, when in mortal danger, an animal's body automatically prepares for freezing or flying, or, as Andy stressed, attack and eat. And this is what's called the sudden hormonal cascade. And it's when the body begins to unconsciously regulate heart rate and digestion and respiratory rate, pupillary response, urination, and even sexual arousal. 
And all of this is done quickly and unconsciously, and they are necessary physiological changes that are designed, if you like, so that the animal is activated and ready for freezing, fleeing, or attacking. So you need to get this into your head. If you're a tiger, you undergo exactly the same physiological changes as the lamb, though the tiger uses the same hormonal adaptions to pounce on the prey, whilst the lamb uses the same adaptions to avoid being eaten. And how the lamb will do this is either become motionless or run. This means that the author must convey the hormonal cascade if they want to describe deadly danger in a persuasive manner. And they must remember that the same physiological changes will be present and ought to be described when they're depicting the prey character as well as when they're depicting the predator character. So here are some tips to convey a real sense of fear in any of your characters, whether they be prey or predator, using the characteristics of the hormonal cascade. So here we go. Number one, change the heartbeat. Change the heartbeat of your character. Faster, slower, conspicuous, obtrusive, discreet. What does the heartbeat sound like? What does the heartbeat feel like? Next, change the skin colour of your character. Did you think that only cuttlefish quickly alter their skin colour to evade detection? Because you need to think again. Humans might also warn off potential predators by turning red or turning pale, turning yellow perhaps. Ever wonder why we blush when we are emotionally discomforted? Well, it's because of a thing called the hormonal cascade. You're changing colour because it may warn off a potential predator. Bubble the enzymes. Normal digestion slows down or even stops during times of acute stress. This is so the body can focus on other priorities. It explains the flapping sensation that you get inside your tummy, the butterflies that we feel when we approach a stressful situation. It also explains the feeling of acute hunger after facing danger. And it's caused by a release of adrenaline. And it's this bubbling of enzymes. And so sometimes we might say that we have the, a sense of collie wobbles when we're in danger. Fear also produces excessive gulping. That's part of the effect. So make sure you describe all of those characteristics when you're describing a character who's faced with mortal danger. And next, loosen the sphincters. If an animal needs to run fast to avoid a hazard, it makes sense to, to dump any waste material, in other words, any excess weight beforehand. Also, a large amount of excrement or a pool of urine can slow down or delay a potential killer. But don't forget that the hunter will also poop and urinate before pouncing. So there's a thought for you. And pressurise the blood. This is so that there is more oxygen pumping around the system, which obviously is connected to the heartbeat. The idea of this is so that the animal can run, and perhaps can overtake or certainly outrun the other. It means that the ears of the animal will become red, the extremities will tingle, and in males, an unexpected effect is sometimes an erection of the penis. When the journalist is visibly shaking after an intense shootout in the HBO television series Generation Kill, Billy Lush's character, uh, a guy named Lance Corporal Trumbly, he tells the civilian, oh, it's all right, it's normal to shake and hyperventilate. So the reporter says, did you shake too? And the Marine said, no, I got an erection. Next, dilate the pupils. An animal needs the biggest and the widest eyes to see danger before it strikes. Or, indeed, it needs to have the biggest and widest eyes to pounce if it's the predator. So dilate the pupils. But tunnel the vision as well, because tunnel the vision slows time down. Yes, the animal brain can actually slow down time. It does this incredible feat by reducing sensory inputs. An example of this phenomena is what we call tunnel vision. And this is where the brain concentrates or relaxes its dilatory muscle response to focus on a single image. One effect of this is it gives the animal better night vision, or conversely, it allows better vision in the bright glare of the sun. So think about how um, Clint Eastwood's cowboy characters always go squinty-eyed before a gunfight in the noonday sun in films like The Good, Bad and the Ugly. 
And the opposite of this is, of course, the bulging scary eyes of terror that we sometimes call Google eyes. If you've ever watched a pet cat creep up on a garden bird, you'll know that you can't get your pet animal's attention as it's sneaking forward. And this is because the animal is using tunnel vision to slow down time. And you'll perhaps not consider this, but the bird is also fixated on just one image. In the bird's case, it's the cat approaching him. And this is why the poor thing can't see or hear you. No matter how much fuss you make, you might be clapping your hands or banging a saucepan, but that bird won't fly away. And this is because the tunnel vision is acting in the correct way, because don't forget, it's reducing sensory inputs. And tunnel the hearing too, which is connected. And this phenomenon, by the way, is known as auditory exclusion, because your pet cat and your garden bird that it's creeping up on will both be doing this as well. They'll be blanking out all extraneous sounds. They'll be concentrating their hearing on just one sound, the only sound that they care about at that moment. And that's the motion noises that the predator or the prey is making. That's all they'll focus on. And we call this sensation in humans ears pricking up. And next, describe involuntary muscle responses. These are also known as the reflex actions. And they're involuntary, as I say, and nearly always instantaneous. And they're movements of muscles and limbs that you may not be aware of. The body of an animal prepares to strike or bolt, readies itself for action. And it does this by stretching or contracting muscles. We often call this the knee-jerk reaction or knee-jerk re reflex. And we use it in a figurative way. But it's also seen when animals are under great stress because they tend to freeze or even sometimes drop down as if they're dead. Humans are known to do this under extreme circumstances. It's a very primitive escape reflex and it can work quite well. And you as a writer must consider it. But you should also think of using the idea as a primitive attack reflex. Because think about your cat again prowling after the garden bird. Your cat will be close to the ground, knees bent, low back, stomach as close as possible to the grass, creeping forward. All of this is an involuntary muscle response. When an actor yells in terror, you know, in a film, you'll often see them lift up and put out their hands, palms facing the attacker, or maybe they'll touch their face. That's all part of the reflex action of fear, and you'll need to describe it in your story. And start the shaking. When we're scared or alarmed, we shake with fear. There's reasons for this. It's most likely because the it prepares the muscles ready for fight and flight, and it warms up the body so that we're at the correct working temperature. If you think about Scooby-Doo's character, Shaggy Rogers, you can remember that he's always shaking with fear. And Shaggy, by the way, is a near-perfect example of panic in the face of deadly danger. And I suggest that you think of Shaggy when you're describing the characteristics of fear. And increase and decrease the size of the animal. This is when an animal suddenly becomes much larger, or conversely much smaller, in the face of a threat. Occasionally you'll see your cat go weird, and when it does its hairs go on end, and it arches its back and it puffs out all its fur, and we've called this the Halloween cat. And the fancy name for this phenomena is known as piloerection, P-I-L-O-E-R-E-C-T-I-O-N, although it's not the type of erection that I mentioned earlier. And it's an unconscious response that's designed to make the animal appear larger and more threatening to a potential enemy than it actually is. And the same phenomenon, by the way, goes into dogs. We call it in dogs raising the hackles. And amazingly, we also have piloerection in humans, because even though we're not covered in fur, we definitely get a experience that we call goosebumps or chills or chicken skin. And if you're pretty close to deadly danger, you'll also feel that your hairs are standing on end. So be sure to describe all of those effects the next time you build your fight or flight scene. And remember also that those phenomena will be present in both the attacker and the attacked. And one last thing I wanted to add about imparting fear. Once the predator has successfully pounced, or once the prey has successfully escaped, there will be consequences. The impact on the physical body after the hormonal cascade can be very debilitating and will be impactful. The character will require rest, food, water, shelter, 
comfort and a sensible period of restoration and regeneration. And I personally don't think that authors pay enough attention to the disastrous and often quite destabilising consequences of flight and flight. It's the main cause of prolonged stress and it leads eventually to hypertension and will be fatal if it's not relieved or controlled. So be sure, please, to correctly describe the recovery and the rehabilitation period that must follow any face-off with deadly danger. So let me know how you're overzoinking your characters. Let me know if you use the Shaggy Rogers tremble, and let me know how you're dealing with the hormonal cascade when you impart fear. Good luck with your project. Bye.